it is not tied to performance would be double taxable. Although well-meaning, clearly what we have done is we have created an environment in which a board acting on behalf of their stockholders is not able to link whatever amount of money they would like to pay in a long and perhaps deferred compensation way, but rather begin by saying for their key executives, how do we work around that law? How do we link it to performance? There is an entire industry that is built up over the last almost two decades of people who in fact help key executives get more money into their incentive plans, then proceed to advise boards as to whether those plans are reasonable, and the upward spiral has continued. I would say that we pay often more than we need to as stockholders for the work done by key executives. But, Mr. Chairman, that is not the issue before us today. The issue before us today is do the American people have a stake in seeing that compensation is limited by these seven companies in order to ensure timely repayment of as much or all of what we have loaned to these companies as possible. Mr. Chairman, I would say that these seven companies are very different. Mr. Chairman, AIG will in all likelihood not return anywhere close to 100 cents in the dollars to the American people. On the other hand, it is likely that Bank of America, Goldman Sachs and others quickly returning the money uh, and, in fact, perhaps returning it sooner if we were not concerned about uh, the, sta the ongoing stability of our economy, we'll s would soon be likely to return the money. And as such, in my opinion, we would no longer have a legitimate right to oversee their pay and compensation. Notwithstanding that, Mr. Chairman, I would since this committee has had a keen interest for a period of time in executive compensation and whether, in fact, the stockholders are being well represented, I would join with you gladly to continue the process of looking at whether or not public companies currently meet the obligation of ensuring that the compensation is the compensation that best is in line with the interest of the stockholders and whether or not those stockholders, if fully <coughs> informed, would validate that pay. Mr. Chairman, I believe that that is the reform that we have an ongoing nature for, not necessarily any one person's pay today. I look forward to hearing from our witness and our panel to follow on whether or not we, in fact, are making the link between the $700 billion uh, TARP and the monies that have been loaned and the American people getting paid back. I hope that we all will leave today's hearing realizing that if we go too far, we endanger the American people's system of capitalism and limited free market that has allowed us to be the envy of the world. Yes, we do prevent antitrust. Yes, we do have rules of the road. And yes, we do have controls over public companies. But, Mr. Chairman, the successes of the past in America should not, in fact, be wiped away because of the sins of a few on Wall Street who perhaps, realizing that bulls and bears were both making money, decided to become pigs. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for his um, statement. Um, <clears throat> today's hearing will consist of two panels. Our first panel witnesses Mr. Kenneth R. Feinberg, who serves as the Special Master for TARP Executive Compensation. Mr. Feinberg has just completed a report regarding the compensation proposal of 25 highest paid employees of the seven recipients of exceptional assistance under TARP. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. Feinberg, and I want to thank you for all your hard work. I can only imagine how difficult it was to balance the competing interests. I know you did not make many friends with your rulings, and I understand that. It is committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in, so if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, respond in the affirmative. I do. Right. Let the record reflect that Mr. Feinberg uh, responded in the affirmative.
we generally uh, move forward with the lights on. We have um, starts at green and then it goes to yellow and then turns to red. But we want you to go without the lights. We're just so anxious and eager to hear what you have to say. So why don't you just begin and then, of course, uh, uh, try to do it within 10 minutes. Okay. You, you may regret that, Mr. Chairman, without the lights. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me and the ranking minority member for inviting me. It's an honor and a privilege to be here today, the first time I've addressed a, a committee here in the Congress on my recent report of last week. I just want to mention at the outset, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and the ranking minority member once again for how much you helped me eight years ago during my administration of the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund. Uh, the two of you and other members of this committee were extraordinarily helpful to me in meeting with the families and um, um, discussing with them the, uh, the benefits of the 9-11 fund. And I thank both of you, uh, really, again, for your help in that regard. I now have a new challenge, uh, executive compensation. I should say at the outset, one reason that this committee uh, hearing room is so crowded is virtually my entire staff is here. I don't think anybody is working today at Treasury from the Office of the Special Master, and um, I'm grateful for their uh, hard work and help. For the last five months, I have a narrow mandate under the law, and that was to determine pay compensation packages for the top 25 officials in just seven companies that received the most TARP assistance. Citigroup, AIG, Bank of America, General Motors, GMAC, Chrysler, and Chrysler Financial. That is the limit of my jurisdiction. I have no authority, no mandatory jurisdiction to determine pay for any other than these seven companies. And even as to these seven companies, only the top 25 officials in each of those companies. The report, which I've submitted, which is now public, and which I've attached to my testimony, is a comprehensive report that explains in great detail the method I used and the conclusions I reached strictly following the statute passed by Congress and the accompanying Treasury regulations. In your letter of invitation, you raise three questions for me to respond to in the course of this testimony. And I will summarize my response. My more detailed response is found in my written testimony. First, you asked what principles guided me in my decisions. The principles that guided me were the legal principles laid out in the statute and the accompanying regulations. Mr. Special Master, Make sure that these companies, as the ranking minority mention, member mentioned, make sure these companies stay in business with compensation packages that will make them thrive, hopefully, and above all, will help them return to the taxpayers the money that was loaned to them initially. But the law also spells out that in establishing these compensation packages, I should consider various other factors. One, let's avoid guaranteed contracts, retention payments, salaries, bonuses, commissions, long-term severance packages, etc. Let's tie as best we can compensation to performance. Let's encourage executive officials to stay on the job and continue to work at these companies. Let's establish compensation packages that will avoid excessive risk taking. These were all principles laid out in the statute that guided me in my work. And my simple summary answer to the principles and the terms and the conditions that I used in reaching my conclusions are found in the public law and the public regulations, and I did my best to enforce the law and the regulations without fear and without favor. The second question you asked is, uh, how did you go about 
determining the compensation packages? What was the process? How did it work? Um, where did you find the companies um, uh, acceptable? Where did you find their recommendations flawed? I requested and received comprehensive submissions from each of the seven companies explaining their view of what they thought they needed for their 25 top officials in the way of a comprehensive package. I examined those submissions with the utmost care and scrutiny, and I concluded that in six of the seven submissions, the information requested, the, the compensation packages urged on me by these companies were contrary to the statute, contrary to the regulations, and contrary to the public interest. They were contrary because each of the submissions, or six of the seven, wanted too much cash guaranteed salary. They wanted stock that would be immediately, on the day it's issued, transferable. They wanted to tie their, their, their salary and their compensation to vague, ambiguous performance standards. They made no mention or insufficient mention of the perks that were part of their overall salary, private airfare, golf club dues, country club dues, etc. And they demanded, as part of their submission, that I honor all old prior grandfathered contracts for compensation that were entered into with officials long before this law was passed and long before I arrived on the scene as the special master. So what did we do in this report? We evaluated the submissions and then we made some what I think were material changes in the overall program. First, we greatly reduced the amount of cash that would be made available to these senior officials. We reduced that cash by approximately 90%. Now, I read with great interest in today's newspaper an article that's, that, that implied or stated that I had actually raised cash base salaries with a number of these officials. It all depends what you mean by cash base salaries. If somebody is getting cash salary guaranteed last year of three million, and now they're getting under my program $300,000 in cash, that sounds to me like a 90% reduction. The article today cited one example of a city official where the base salary for that official, according to the article, was raised by the special master to $475,000, an increase of 111%. What the article does not point out is last year, that same official received from Citi $13 million in cash. And under my report, that cash was reduced by 98%. So I am very comfortable in defending my report and saying that overall, one of our primary objectives succeeded in this report for these seven companies was to reduce absolute guaranteed cash by 90%. Second, we required, in addition to the cash salaries, that when we issue stock in the company that is salarized stock, that is part of the salary, that stock may not be cashed out for up to four years. The stock can be cashed after two years, one third, three years, another third, and four years, the last third. We want to keep people on the job with a vested interest in the company. If you want salarized stock, the value of that stock is tied to the performance of the company and the goal, the, the ranking minority member couldn't have said it better. The goal is keeping the company moving so that the taxpayers get their money back. Third, 
we said no more unlimited perks. No more private jets, no more golf club dues, no more country club dues. Perks under the report are limited to $25,000 per individual. Anything more than $25,000, you've got to come back to the special master for uh, approval and monitoring of those requested excessive perks. Finally, what did we say with these companies about these old grandfathered contracts that are purportedly in the hundreds of millions of dollars? Well, we worked with the seven companies. They were very, very cooperative. Very cooperative. And in almost every case, we worked out a system whereby any grandfathered amounts that were due and owing as compensation would be voluntarily rolled over four years before it totally vests, and we removed all of those grandfathered um, valid contracts and got the companies to voluntarily agree that it would be ill-advised, unwise, to, to demand payment on those old contracts. And instead, in almost every case, we mutually agreed that those grandfathered amounts should be rolled over prospectively into future stock with a vested interest in the company. That is what we did, um, spelled out in some detail in the report. Finally, your letter of invitation, Mr. Chairman, asked me to comment on any recommendations I might have going forward in dealing with executive compensation. I should remind the committee that my first obligation right now underway, under the law, is to design a compensation structure for officials 26 to 100 in each of these seven companies. Right now, we are actively doing that. By the end of this year, we will have designed and implemented not individual pay packages for 26 to 100, but overall compensation structure for employees 26 to 100 in these seven companies. Then, uh, if the Secretary of the Treasury so requests, I will turn my attention immediately in January to compensation packages for 2010 for these same seven companies and the 25 individuals in 2010 that are covered by the statute. So those two objectives, 26 to 100, 2010, the law spells out expressly those are part of my ongoing uh, obligations. I want to just finally address a point that uh, the ranking minority member just made. I do not believe that this law should be extended to encompass other companies. The law was enacted to deal with the taxpayers of this country as creditors of these seven companies. And whatever one might think about whether or not it's a good idea or a bad idea for the federal government to be involved in setting compensation for private companies, I, I suggest that what Congress was stating was that this is an exception. These seven companies are owned by the taxpayer. And the taxpayer, as creditors, are asking these companies to, to rein in compensation and come up with compensation packages that will maximize the likelihood, first and foremost, that the taxpayers will get their money back. And that is my primary objective. I do not believe, as the administration has stated elsewhere, that we should be micromanaging other companies in the private sector. I'm hoping that the report that I issued and the recommendations that I've made as to these seven companies will have some effect voluntarily in, in um, influencing how the private sector goes about establishing compensation practices. And my, one of my objectives is hopefully that with my recommendations, other companies on Wall Street and elsewhere will take to heart what I have suggested, 
what is mandated for these seven companies, and hopefully uh, the, uh, the model that is created in my report uh, will um, trickle and expand beyond these seven companies. But I agree with the minority member that um, I'm perfectly comfortable, thank you, limited to these seven companies, and uh, that's enough work for me, and I'm hopeful that uh, the committee will find my report helpful and useful. I am prepared to answer any questions, and frankly, I am prepared in the weeks and months ahead to work with this committee, um, to, to um, consult with the committee uh, as the committee deems appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this thank summary. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, and thank you for the job that you've done. Um, um, of course, um, let me begin by asking you, um, do they really get it that the fact that the American people are angry about this excessive pay? Well, you, you'll, you'll, you'll have to ask the seven companies uh, I found that the submissions uh, did not adequately address uh, the, the major concerns expressed by the American people. Right. How do you deal with the contract situation now, where you person has a contract and um, which has been signed, and of course now all of a sudden you, um, that you're asking that he gives back? I mean, what was the reaction to that, or how did you handle it? The law that was enacted gives me three options when it comes to old contracts for compensation that were entered into long before this law was passed and my office was created. First, I examine the contract to determine whether or not in my independent judgment I found the contract to be valid or not. I want the committee to understand that the sanctity of contract under the Constitution is very, very important, and I was loath to find contracts invalid when they were entered into years ago between officials and the company. So there was not a case where I terminated or invalidated a contract. But that's just the beginning of the inquiry, Mr. Chairman. The law then said, if I found a contract valid, I could, under the law, attempt with the company and the official to renegotiate that contract voluntarily. That worked very well. With, a, with, with, with one or two or three exceptions, in every single case, the company worked with me and my staff in renegotiating those old contracts so that they would be turned into stock in the company moving forward and would be subject to the same rules and restrictions as 2009 salarized stock. Then the law said, if a company refused to negotiate a valid contract, and that was very, very rare, the law permitted me I have to honor that contract, but the law permitted me to take that contract amount into consideration in setting 2009 salary, and that's what I did in those cases. You want that contract enforced? It's a valid contract. The Constitution protects it? Okay. But I am going to look at the amount of that contract, and I am going to factor into my perspective 2009, 2010 salaries, the fact that, you, that we had to honor that contract because it wasn't renegotiated. And I think we've done that fairly successfully. Right. Thank you very much. And um, uh, this is on AIG. Can you do anything to stop AIG from paying nearly $180 million in bonuses next year to employees in the very AIG division, most responsible for the failure of AIG. Um, that is the uh, financial products division. Um, you pose a question which the special master will have to address very quickly in 2010 when those allegedly guaranteed contracts come up. And we're going to have to see with AIG, and, and let me just say, AIG has been quite cooperative in this process. We've met with them numerous times. Um, we will have to sit down with AIG 
uh, in 2010, in a couple of months, January, and uh, I am admonished by your question, Mr. Chairman, that this committee is looking at these contracts, and we will see what we can work out with AIG going forward uh, in an effort to uh, satisfy the statute, satisfy the regulations, satisfy the American people, and um, I view that as a top priority. Because you have to recognize, you know, um, uh, people feel that if you failed, that you should not be rewarded for your failure. And of course, um, and that's a big issue. And that's why the American people are so angry, because in many instances, the government is now bailing out people, and of course, who fail, and they're getting a, a bonus. I now yield to the ranking member, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to go through something before I actually wage into questions, just because I want to set the tone of this hearing so that it not be uh, in any way uh, confrontational. Is it fair to say, and I'm going to make the assumption it is, but I'll ask you for confirmation, General Motors was bankrupt, Chrysler was bankrupt, and their financial uh, divisions, their uh, GMAC and so on, not because of the financial crisis. They were already in trouble had a real problem with their cost of doing business, et cetera, and then they were caught up in that last nail in the coffin. So four out of your seven companies, it's fair to say, these are companies that, that are bankrupt and not even directly related to the collapse, but tangentially related to the collapse, and as such are under your purview. Is that fair to say? I guess it's fair to say, uh, Congressman, I, I have enough problems focusing on executive comp without figuring out exactly what caused the bankruptcies, but I guess that the assumption in your question is accurate, okay. yes. And, and secondly, we own those companies because whatever amount we took, we took and do not expect to get it all back because we put a lot into them that is not coming back, particularly Chrysler, I think, notably. That's correct. Uh, or Chrysler Division of Fiat, however you want to put it. So I'm going to leave those companies alone for a moment. Uh, and I'm going to concentrate on the big three. AIG is, when my opening statement I said that AIG was unlikely to return all of the money, do you share that with us, that you're trying to maximize the return but without an expectation that we're going to, whether we pay them a little or a lot, we're not probably going to get $180 billion back? I think that's right, and I think that in the submissions that AIG provided us and in our conversations with AIG, uh, that is a fair assumption. Okay. so. Again, we own 80 percent of AIG. We're not likely to get paid all, the, all back. You're managing it on behalf of the stockholders, which are the American people. Okay, we'll go to the top two. City, it now looks like, was really in a lot more trouble than people understood. B of A, not so much. Fair to say. Yes. B of A is likely to return all the money and over a period of time that is reasonably maybe three years or whatever. City, there's still a little bit of, of doubt. So when you're managing all seven of these, do you manage them to maintain the best 25 people to maximize the return to the American people? I deal with each of the seven differently, as you point out, and you are absolutely right that my primary statutory obligation is to set compensation so that the taxpayer gets their money back. That is correct. And and now I get into the a little bit harder part of this. Looking at B of A and AIG, more than half of their top 25 people have left. Does it concern you that many of those people had contracts and they had to, they had to balance, okay, I can, I can make nothing going forward or I can renegotiate my contract or I can take what I'm entitled to and leave? Do you believe that, that that this limitation that was put on to your maneuverability led to some of those people leaving, and has it hurt, it's hard to measure, hurt having that question of do we have the best 25 people to maximize the return to the American people? I can't answer that question because I'm not sure the vagaries and the, 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 the various reasons that people leave a company. They may have left because they didn't want to be under the thumb of the special master. They may have left- And you're so nice. Well, I'm sorry? Well, that's what you say. Yeah. Um, they may have left because they had another job opportunity. They may have left because they didn't even want the public glare. I don't know the reasons they left, but I agree with you, um, m m um, Congressman. I said that, that it is a concern. Yes. Well, following up on that concern, because the, de the details of what you, 
the breadth and width of what you can negotiate. Ford is doing better, and Ford is innovating, and Ford is able to be sort of the standalone one American company that didn't that isn't under scrutiny. Are you concerned that they will hire the best and the brightest from Chrysler and GM? Similarly, with only City, AIG, and B of A, and we'll leave AIG out, but City and B of A under your direct control, is it very possible that some of these individuals will leave the best for better pay, and as a result, yes, we'll get people that will work for the wages we set, but will we, in fact, be hurting B of A's long-term uh, future on behalf of the stockholders, of which we are only t a temporary stockholder? Yes. And the statute agrees with you in spelling out that one important factor I must consider is the retention and attraction of good people to these companies in order for them to thrive and repay the American taxpayer. Mr. Chairman, if I could ask just one quick follow-up. If that's the case, should we look at a statute that envisions, particularly as to City and B of A, a vote of the stockholders or some kind of affirmation by the long-term stockholders of these companies that, in fact, they agree with the pay packages we're setting as in the best interest, obviously the board commenting, you commenting, but leave something to those stockholders that the chairman and I both said we had to further empower into the pay decision. You and other members of Congress are now looking at this whole question of corporate governance, how to empower shareholders, independent compensation committees, independent consultants on comp. Uh, that whole area of corporate governance uh, is something that is worthy of consideration by Congress, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Th thank you very much. I'm wondering if Wall Street will curb its excessive bonus culture without government intervention, I mean, based on what he was saying. You think that will happen? Again, uh, it's a murky crystal ball, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Clay from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Feinberg, for being here. I, uh, I applaud your diligence uh, in the difficult task that was set before you of uh, reeling in excessive executive compensation uh, is an important mission and is of great benefit to our economy and to the American taxpayer. Uh, I continue to be alarmed by the reported trends in executive compensation that expose the disproportionate uh, nature of corporate pay packages. According to the research, uh, pay to CEOs is at an all-time high at over 400 times the average worker's pay. How has executive pay grown to these extreme amounts? And what factors contributed to these trends? I'm not a historian in terms of uh, the causes of the growth. Uh, I confronted under the statute and the regulations clear uh, uh, directives to rein in uh, compensation while at the same time making sure these companies repay the taxpayer. Uh, others have written on the various reasons that the gap has grown between executive compensation and line workers, uh, uh, and I've tried to take that into account in, in uh, limiting uh, executive comp in, uh, under my mandate. You know, I have long been concerned about guaranteed bonuses. Uh, as we have seen with AIG, guaranteed bonuses and incentives do not seem to encourage productivity. Aren't guaranteed bonuses of any kind inconsistent with effective risk management? Well, I think they are. I don't know about of any kind. There may be some that haven't crossed my desk. But you will find in my report, I think it's fair to say, other than base cash salary, a complete rejection of the notion of guaranteed compensation. Uh, instead, we tie the overwhelming amount of compensation for these executive officials to performance, not guarantees, and have worked as best we can to eliminate guaranteed payments as part of any compensation package. In, in order to hold TARP recipients fully responsible, is there any possibility of nullifying prior payment obligations to executives? Yes, we've been very successful in doing that. As I mentioned to the chairman and the ranking minority member, in almost every case 
where we confronted a prior guaranteed contract, we were able to negotiate voluntarily with the companies and get them to yield on that guaranteed contract and instead roll that amount into stock going forward over four years tied to performance. Have, have any employees or recipients taken legal action because of your, uh, be, because of those corporations' actions? No. 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 Okay. Um, We're very persuasive. Um. <laughs> uh, have the, the um, huge bonuses led to a, uh, a culture of entitlement? In other words, do executives now expect packages like this regardless of performance? I think huge guaranteed bonuses undercut performance. If you're guaranteed a huge cash salary, or you're guaranteed a bonus regardless of performance, or you're guaranteed commission payments regardless of sales. I think that what we learned is that undercuts the statutory directive that we tie compensation more to the overall financial health of these seven companies. And that's what we tried to do in the report. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your response, Mr. Thank you. Feinberg. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. And now I yield to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, here's a quote by an executive from one of the companies. He says, there's no question people have left because of uncertainty of our ability to pay. It's a highly competitive market out there. One of the things that concerns me is that you have top talent. And you said that you had some people that were making, what, $13 million, and you cut them down to 350,000 or something like that. Why would anybody in their right mind, if they're an executive for a company like that who has the talent to manage and run a company, why would they take a pay cut from 13 million down to 350,000 and does that damage the company? Absolutely it would damage the company and that isn't what we did. What we did is we took 13 uh, Congressman Burton, we took 13 million dollars in guaranteed cash reduced it to $350,000 in guaranteed cash and told that executive, we'll give you $13 million or $9 million or $8 million, I don't know the exact amount, in stock. Now, you're, you have a vested interest in that stock. If that stock over the next four years goes up, you may get more than, than well, this. Let me, let me interrupt so you. So we tried to tie it. Yeah. Well... Uh, if a person uh, has a, 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 a contract, uh, and you said, I think you used the term alleged contracts, if they have a contract that uh, guarantees a certain amount of money, and you say you want them to renegotiate that and pay them $350,000, what would be the rationale for them to take the $350,000 and not go ahead with the contract and take their money? The rationale would be, A, that they want to stay at the company and redeem that stock in value that may be even more than $13 million. Well, I, I, I can understand that you believe these people have, uh, have uh, the best interests of the company at heart, and, and probably they do. But when you're talking about that kind of a, a cut and whether or not somebody could get that money Im immediately within the contract, uh, it seems to me that most people would take the money and run. And as I said before, this quote says very clearly that they said it's a highly competitive market out there, and uh, they're jumping ship. Now, if they jump ship and you don't have top talent running these companies, the American taxpayer, who's the majority stockholder, has inferior people running the company. Doesn't that concern you? It sure does. So and what do you do about that? I think that if you look at the, uh, at, at the uh, levels of total compensation that we established in our determination, we think it, I made this recommendation, or my conclusion, they won't jump ship. They won't. I well, think they already, that they already have. Some have, before well, my recommendations. Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, I understand you're doing what you've been uh, instructed to do. But it doesn't make any sense to me if somebody has a contractual uh, a guarantee of a certain amount of money that they're going to take $350,000 and then say, okay, I'll take it in stock when you have an economy like we have right now and they can take the money and go. And if they go to another company, they can make the same, same amount of money or maybe even more than they were making where they are. So the top talent, it seems to me, would be encouraged to leave. 
Now, the other thing I wanted to ask you is this. Who do you answer to when you make these decisions? Under the law, I make these, these the, I have final authority, non-appealable. These decisions are mine and mine alone. I serve at the discretion of the Secretary of the Treasury. But, but he doesn't have, I mean, once you make a decision, you don't say to him, this is what my recommendation is. You just, the decision is final. Under the law is written, the regulations uh -huh. afford me final binding authority to issue those determinations. That, that's a Treasury regulation. It's not a law, is it not? That's the Treasury regulations that de de uh, evolve out of the statute, yes. Yeah, but, but, but the point is, as far as accountability is concerned, and I'm not inferring that you're not doing a good job, I'm just saying that you really don't answer to anybody. Well, I answer to this committee and other committees with oversight well, functions. Let's, let's, let's be straight about this. You, you, you the, you're the czar. You make the decision, that's it, right? Under the law, I make the decision. Okay. So if these people leave these companies because they are not being compensated as was in the contract, and I'm saying, not saying they didn't make too much money and they were accountable and didn't do their job properly. I'm just saying when you need top talent to run a company like General Motors or, or Chrysler or AIG, you want people there that can really do the job. Now, they may not have done their job right in the past, but they may have the knowledge and the talent to do the job. And you're saying to them, here, we're going to renegotiate your contract and you take $350,000 and we'll extend it and give you stock for the $13 million that you, you were going to get. And they say, hey, the heck with that. I want my money and I'm going to leave. And so you have people that don't have the knowledge and the competence to run that company. And so the stockholders, the American people, are in danger of seeing their money, the, the TARP money, going down the tubes because the company doesn't respond. My response to you, Congressman, is this. I have tried my best in this report to implement that statutory directive that they stay on the job and that the taxpayer get his money back. I'll defend these recommendations. Now, you may say, if I were doing your job, I would have a different level of compensation or do it differently. Fine. I did the best I could to try and maximize the very objective you're stating, which is keep these people on the job. And I think we've done that. Mr. Chairman, may yeah. I have one, one final question, please? Yeah, uh, I'd be okay. delighted to yield to the gentleman an additional minute. The Federal, the Federal Reserve's issued guidelines under which the Fed would review, if necessary, or amend or reject the compensation policies of all banks regulated by the Fed. Are you familiar with that? Uh, that's just come out last week, yes. Yeah. That really concerns me because what we're talking about is you or somebody going beyond where you are right now and regulating people that did not get TARP money simply because they're regulated by the Fed. What do you think about that? Congressman, my limit, what I'm doing to these seven and only these seven companies, what the Federal Reserve is, is proposing or whatever is not on my watch. And uh, um, you'll have to ask the Federal Reserve about the, the scope of those regulations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now yield um, five minutes to the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Marcy Kapture. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, Mr. Feinberg, thank you for coming today. From whom did you receive the first call suggesting you be appointed to your present position? I received the first call from the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Neil Wolin. All right. And who else did you hear from prior to your appointment? Uh, the only other person is the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, and approximately when did those calls happen? Earlier this year? I'm sorry? When did those calls happen? Earlier this year? Yes. I think about five or six months ago. All right. Is your federal position classified as Schedule C, or are you classified as civil service or some other category? Special government employee. Special government employee? Yes. Does that mean you have a special contract with the Treasury? I believe that is the case. All right. And that's a matter of public record? Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, for whom did you work uh, prior to your current position? I was in a private law firm in private practice. Okay, and could you state the name of that firm for the record, Yes, the please? name of the firm is Feinberg Rosen LLP. All right, and where are they located? Washington, D.C. and New York City. New York City. Where's their principal headquarters? Washington, D.C. Do you have any relationship with that firm now? Uh, yes. All right, could you state the relationship of that firm? I, I am the founding partner of the firm. 
your founding partner. Yes. Is it true uh, that um, three of the institutions whose compensation you are supervising are or have been clients of that firm, including Citigroup, Citibank, AIG, and Bank of America with the acquisition of Merrill Lynch? No, that is not true. That is not true? No. Uh, it has been reported in the press that that is actually the case. So the in the client press, it's list, not true. It's not true. Are any of the institutions under your pur purview, uh, have they been clients of that company? No. They have not. All right. Uh, let me ask you, you stated that it's a good idea to tie the um, stock opportunities for employees of these companies to a four-year term, all right? And you said it pays out a third in what year? A third after two years, a third after three years, and a third after four years. All right. You know, that doesn't sound very long-term to me. How did you arrive at four years? Well, it was, it's a very difficult question. We concluded that asking individuals to delay the payment of their salary beyond a fourth year would simply work too much of a hardship, that, that, that uh, it is a problem of, of keeping them on the job and trying to get the taxpayer's money back. We concluded that a four-year payout of salary was a, a fair limitation. Now, what we also did, Congresswoman, which is implicit in your question, we also required that any additional stock that might be issued to these uh, officials, it would not vest for at least three years and would not be redeemable at all until top loan money was repaid to the taxpayer. So that was the balance we struck. Um, I don't, I guess I just find it surprising, you know, if you look at a two-year time horizon, a three-year time horizon, a four-year time horizon, and the way I look at the world, that isn't a very long time at all. Well, it, 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 it may not be a long time, I guess it's relative, but our concern um, uh, uh, was that if we are reducing compensation for these officials across the board by about 50 percent, and we are obligated to keep these companies in business to repay loan taxpayer money, that asking uh, these officials to wait more than four years to redeem their salarized stock was simply too onerous. Now, maybe it should have been five years or six years. We thought four years was a pretty good compromise. On the outer edge, but on the inner edge, it's two years. You were quoted in the New York Times uh, October 23rd stating anybody making $100 million a year is engaged in excessive risk. Uh, you approve compensation packages worth $9 million or more for six executives, including one at AIG, two at Bank of America, and three at Citigroup. That $9 million is 23 times as much as the pay for the President of the United States, 46 times the pay for the Fed Chair and Treasury Secretary, and more than 50 times as much as a military general. How did you determine that that amount was not contrary to the public interest? Well, we did it in a number of ways. First, we gathered all the data we could gather and examined the data as to what constitute competitive marketplace uh, compensation. Then what we did is we made sure that that nine million or eight million was not guaranteed compensation. The cash component of that nine million is likely to be $500,000 or less, the rest of it as Congressman Burton pointed out, the rest of it is tied to stock, which cannot be redeemed at once, has to be held two, three, four years. And a big chunk of that compensation cannot be redeemed by the official until and unless top money is repaid to the taxpayer. So it may be nine million in theory, but in practice, we believe it'll be a lot less than that. Thank you, thank time you, Mr. Expired. Chairman. I General would like to place in the record information we have about the clients of uh, the gentleman's uh, law firm and uh, would appreciate response. Thank you so thank very, you very much. much. Without objection. Uh, gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm, I'm sure it doesn't uh, shock Mr. Uh, Feinberg that uh, some of us on the Republican side have uh, 
uh, as outraged as we are about the salaries, as outraged as we are about the uh, corruption and the crisis that was triggered by greed, that we have deep uncomfortability about the government, in effect, taking over the majority of these companies or having somebody setting their salaries. I, I will say um, the word czar does fit you, and you seem to fit comfortably in the word czar, uh, as uh, we've uh, debated, because if you don't have anybody directly that you're reporting to and you're uh, explaining how you make uh, these decisions, but it's still, uh, what, a little scary as an elected official or as people watching in the country to see one person with this uh, much power over major institutions in our society and the, uh, the uh, challenges to how are you making decisions, who are you talking to, uh, why aren't you reporting to any elected official directly in the Treasury Department or the President uh, is not a good precedent for a democracy. Now let me ask you a, uh, a fundamental question. AIG is, we talk about it like it's one company. In reality, it's what, 80 financial and 120 insurance or the other way around. Did you separate out in this top 25 those who, ha and not all divisions were, were bad, uh, that did you separate out um, which divisions actually caused the problem? Uh, same at Bank of America. Bank of America, Citibank, had traditional banking things that were regulated and their compensation might have been fair inside that industry. But they had these non-bank rogue divisions that went crazy. Are you doing all 25 evaluations as if it's one institution rather than, in fact, separate institutions, some of which clearly caused the problem and some of which didn't because of incompetent management? Under the law, I'm looking at the top 25 compensated individuals at AIG as the parent. In other words, I'm not looking at seven people at this unit and five people at that unit in determining the top 25. That was really submitted to us by the company itself under the law. In other words, from that. my question is then Congress didn't separate. We blended them all together. Now, let me uh, go back because what the American people are frustrated with was that we had, and I voted for TARP every time it's come up. Okay? Because I believe our country is going to collapse because some of these people didn't look at basic, you know, economies growing at 16 percent over four years, housing is going up at 200 percent. What kind of incompetent person can't figure out that people may, for example, be self-reporting income? How in the world nobody looked at the risk of securitization? Why didn't they uh, ask in the, the bonding companies that we've had in here, the rating companies, why didn't anybody at these different companies say, hey, isn't it strange that these companies are getting AAA for selling us bad credit? Why were they only checking 10 to 20 percent and then paying bonuses if you cleared these? The question I have is, are we aimed at the wrong thing? Why are we looking at compensation here rather than do you think we could have looked at, because one of the questions, oh, we have to pay these people this or they'll go to another company. What about stigma here, that you were incompetent? Wouldn't we have been better off? analyzing what actually went wrong in these companies, finding out which managers were clearing it, holding them accountable by whether they performed their basic duty or whether they looked the other way to get profit in their company, and in effect, through investigations, whether it was violation of the law or incompetence, putting a stigma on them, and all of a sudden, pay would have been different. The problem in an oligopolistic situation right now is we don't have pure capitalism working. There, the bonding companies didn't work like capitalism was supposed to work. The stockholders and the boards weren't paying enough attention. In an investigation here, isn't the real problem not the compensation, but that people who did crummy jobs aren't being singled out. The, the next tier of management, wink, wink, the next tier of management, wink, wink, and you're treating in Bank of America and Citibank and AIG those who participated in this huge cover-up and incompetence, the same as those who were running the traditional banking part, and they're all part of the parent. Congressman, I can only say in response to your... Um, I ask your opinion, though, not just what you're required to by law. Well, but I mean, I think that is a fair answer. I, I'm, I'm confronted with a statute and some regulations, and I'm asked to very expressly and specifically deal with what Congress has asked me to deal with. You're, you're raising some I'm, very good questions. I'm asking you, you're inside now. You're looking at these. You've got to be measuring these different execs, and one of them maximize his return and, in fact, could go over to Chase or somebody. Uh, if you're trying to keep him there, um, don't you look at whether they were competent in their area? In other words, if you adjusted some of their pay by whether or not they were over an area, 
that, that unbelievably rewarded people who were behind in their mortgages as more value in securitization than people who were paying. Now, that is some kind of stupidity, no risk management, yet you're analyzing and people, uh, isn't that one of the variables, even under statute, that would measure whether or not they're employable? I think to the extent that you're asking, do we also look at the importance, the role of the individual, how long they've been at the company, what capacity they served? Yes, we do look at that. Did they you're handle these toxic things and overlook? I also think, if I may, Congressman, you're raising an, implicitly, you're raising a very important question raised earlier, which is the extent to which, quite apart from my compensation decisions, what about corporate governance reform designed to rein in the discretion of some of these officials? And that is a subject which is, of course, worthy of and is now being considered by Congress. Right. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cuellar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Feinberg, for being here with us. And I understand you have a very difficult job, and I appreciate it. Uh, I guess if I can look at the scenario, this is what the scenario is. You have uh, companies that have received TARP dollars, uh, companies that have not received TARP dollars, and, and of course, you have the regulators also, the federal regulators. And, and I guess the basic premise is if you received federal dollars, therefore, we can dwell into your compensation. Uh, regardless of your performance or not. And if you have not received federal uh, uh, TARP dollars, then we're not going to get into the free market forces. Is that pretty much correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, we're, we talked about compensation, and I think in the past when IAG took off all, you know, those, remember those conferences that they went off, and, and there was an outrage from the public saying, why are they going to those uh, conferences and meeting those uh, luxurious? Uh, uh, resorts, people were saying, you, you got to watch out how you spend those dollars. You understand? You remember yes, that? Yes, I remember that. All right. Um, so I guess one of the things that we have to look at as legislators is sometimes the public looks at perception saying, if you all are the regulators, then you have to watch what you do also. Um, and I'm just reading something that just came out in the Washington Post. Uh, I believe that, uh, I think it was on October 19th, uh, the uh, Fed chairman, Ben Bernick, and I think about several of his employees went to a October 19, it was an October 19 San Francisco Fed conference on Asian and global financial situation. Uh, they went and they traveled to the Baccarat Resort and Spa near Santa Barbara. They were California, I guess. Some of those suites go up to $2,000 a night, and you can go on and on and on and on and on. Um, I think uh, out of the 100 participants there, I believe one-third of the participants there were federal employees. Now, whether they got good discounts on the hotel rooms, it was not during the season. Uh, you know, I guess, and I know that's not under your watch, and I don't mean to put you on this, but I guess that's one of the things we've got to be very, very careful, because if you have TARP, non-TARP entities, and then you have the federal regulators saying you've got to watch what you do and spend the money, we just have to be very careful how we regulate. Any comments without you going to I, I, I completely I, I can completely agree with your comment about being careful. I assure you that the Office of the Special Master is very, very cognizant of your concern about image and how it looks with the regulators. And um, I can't speak for the Federal Reserve, but I can tell you that our office is very cognizant of that concern about perks and excessive uh, compensation, travel allowances, et cetera. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Feinberg, for your testimony. I appreciate your how candid you are. Um, and uh, I was saying to a colleague that uh, your extreme confidence is uh, necessary with the extreme job that you have. Um, but I also appreciate you just being frank with us, and that's what we need. Um, now, in, in terms of, I just want to touch on a couple things quickly, and I've got some other questions, but um, you report to the Secretary of the Treasury. He's your boss. Is that correct? correct? How often do you meet with uh, Secretary Geithner? Uh, I've met with the Secretary probably three or four times in the last five months. In, in the last how many months? Five months. Five months. Okay. Um, so every other month, roughly. Okay. Um, and and in, in terms of um, this discussion about cash, okay? In your, in your testimony, you discuss cash, okay? 
And when people hear that, and when I read the Wall Street Journal story, I think that the language differential here is important, the distinction. You're talking about cash as your daily, your monthly salary or weekly salary, however they pay. And then if you get a cash bonus at the end of the year, that's your cash package, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, the Wall Street Journal story that you reference in your opening statement says that you raise the base pay for, for uh, 89 individuals, you cut it for a couple others, you left it the same for others. That is their base salary that they receive monthly. Is that correct? Uh, that, that's what the Wall Street Journal says. My, my definition of base salary is quite different. My definition of base salary is not only what you get twice a month, but also drawers that may be provided you over the course of the year, guaranteed commissions, guaranteed bonuses. The example, Congressman, that the, Wall that the uh, news article referred to said that in one case with Citibank, I had raised the base salary to, uh, by 111% mm -hmm. to $475,000. I pointed out earlier to the committee that the total cash that that person, that official received last year was $13 million, and I reduced it by 98%. And, and that, that $13 million figure is not uh, any stock awards? That was cash. That was cash? Cash. Okay. All right. I just want to understand this distinction because I read here, uh, I read in the Wall Street Journal one, one story, and then I hear a testimony which is different. I just want to understand, you're talking about that twice a month. Their comparison here is the twice, twice a month pay or monthly pay to what you're now setting as their monthly pay. I guess that's right. It's unclear to me in that story okay. what they mean. So what you're looking at is you, you would up that base uh, uh, guarantee uh, in that factor. But the rest you're, you're, you're having with stock. Now, I'm right? also eliminating all cash guarantees, like bonuses guaranteed regardless of performance, like commissions guaranteed regardless of sales, like any other type of cash guarantee. Those okay. are completely eliminated under my program. Okay, I want to I discuss a larger issue here. Uh, do you use compensation consultants within your office? In the office of the special master? Yes. yes. Okay. Are these, this, uh, are, are these compensation consultants uh, that have other clients? No. Out they're, no they're, uh, they may have clients that I'm not aware of. They're both academics. Both academics. Okay. All right. Now, in terms of compensation consultants, there's been a lot of discussion about this. Okay, but I think there's another piece here, which is the tax ramifications for salary and bonuses. Have you encountered this as a challenge in dealing with these institutions? We certainly have. Can you discuss, t because we're in Congress here, we set the tax rules. What can we do to make the tax code uh, more effective so that executives' actions are tied to shareholders' interests? Well, that's a, a complicated question about the tax code. I'd have to get back to you on that. I can tell you that you're absolutely right, Congressman, that, that we run into these problems every day in establishing deferred compensation. You know, it, it may vest today under the law, but it's not redeemable for two years, three years, four years. What are the tax consequences of this? And we've run into that problem. And I'll be glad to, uh, you know, get back to you and lay out some of the tax uh, issues that have arisen in the course of my five months on the job. No, I'd, I'd certainly appreciate that. I will. Uh, finally, the, the, the number of 25, okay? I, I find it arbitrary. Do you find it arbitrary? Yeah, of, oh, it's, uh, okay. of course you, it's, it's have arbitrary. You, have you encountered this as a problem where you have two executives, one makes marginally more than the other, uh, one's the number 26th executive, the other's the number 25th, and then perhaps you have a class of people that are, that are very similar to what uh, the, the 20th or 25th executive that, that fall under your purview. Have you seen anything uh, with currently that you have the, the 26th executive making more than the people that you have, you've just given new rules to? No, we haven't seen that yet. Of course, we haven't yeah. got to the new top 25 in 2010, yeah. Yeah. which may vary. Uh, we haven't seen the problem yet of uh, the difference between number 25 and 26. What we are seeing 
is the arbitrariness of 26 to 100 when the hundredth person is cut off at 100 and there may be hundreds or thousands of employees at 101 and 102 and 1,000 and 5,000 and 10,000 that are subject to the same compensation structure. So we're running into that problem a little bit, but hopefully we'll be able to come up with a program that'll take that into account. Thank you for time has expired. Right. And Mr. Chairman, if I, if I may submit for the record uh, a question I have about, uh, about contracting out services that are not under your purview as well. Right. Without objection, so ordered. Now I recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Feinberg, I thank you and I thank your, your staff for the tremendous work that you've been doing. We, I think we all really appreciate it. Uh, I, have, I have questions in two areas, but first a brief statement. Uh, trying to figure out what's the, quote, right level of compensation obviously ultimately uh, is an arbitrary decision. Uh, but there's been a premise in corporate America that the more you're paid, the more you're worth. Uh, disgraced uh, and incompetent executives who walked away with hundreds of millions of dollars, Stanley Neal, Richard Fold, the list goes on, uh, have proven that to be wrong. Uh, and I think the two concerns that we have here in Congress are, one, what compensation practices are going to drive a constructive business model so that bankers make money by lending rather than ripping folks off on kite schemes like subprime mortgages. And then number two, uh, with respect to the taxpayer bailout, uh, which uh, was presented to us uh, as something that had to be done even if we didn't want to do it, how can we get some of that money back for the American taxpayer? And uh, this isn't in your purview, but it's a question I want to ask because you probably have more practical experience on this than anyone in America, and certainly more than any of us on the committee. Among the TARP recipients was Goldman Sachs. They've since paid that money back with interest. And Goldman Sachs is good at what it does, and it's now on track to have another year of record profits and likely to award bonuses in the range of 21 to $23 billion to its employees. Part of their bottom line profit came from a taxpayer payment to AIG, over $100 billion. AIG took the taxpayer money and wrote a $12.9 billion check to Goldman to cover collateral uh, uh, debt obligations uh, and some of these exotic instruments that were in jeopardy uh, because of the collapse of AIG. Do you have an opinion as to whether or not uh, Goldman Sachs uh, should repay taxpayers that $12.9 billion before it awards $21 billion in bonuses to its employees? Uh, Congressman, I don't have an opinion. Um, I'm a, I, I've read that, that, that story just as others have. Um, I have enough difficulty uh, focusing on the seven companies that are on my watch. And whether or not Goldman should either voluntarily or by force of Congress, congressional directive, um, repay. Well, let me um, ask you this. I, I understand you have a limited purview, and, and I can't tell you that nobody's listening, and it's just between us. <laughs> but I know that one of your concerns is taxpayer fairness. And again, that's in the eye of the beholder, but it's a fairness standard. And one of the things that we've learned in this entire catastrophe of the financial meltdown is that most of the things that were done that are truly outrageous and harmful to taxpayers in our economy were all legal. Legal, but not fair and not right. And if we're going to restore some sense of fairness that the American taxpayer needs, do you think that we've got to address uh, such transfers where the goal of the taxpayer bailout was to revive the financial system, but not to reward any individual firm. Yes, I'm hopeful that the model that we have developed for the seven companies that's in this report, and executive compensation is not the answer to all of these problems, but to the extent that executive compensation is, uh, has a, a role to play going forward in, in, in um, in improving the economy and, and, and in promoting fairness. I'd like to think that the recommendations we have made in this report might be adopted voluntarily 
by other companies uh, on Wall Street and might be seen as one step among many that can be taken uh, to deal with the overall problem. Okay, thank you. I yield back. To, thank you, Mr. Feinberg. Thank you very much. I now yield to the gentleman from California, Congressman Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Feinberg, I guess with my wife on the other side of the continent, I spent some quality time with Publius uh, Hamilton and the Federalist Papers last night, and I'm just thinking of what our founding fathers must be thinking watching um, the entire process uh, that we're talking about today. The concept of the federal government is actually looking at these kind of private sector jurisdictions that have changed. And I think rightfully so, we should be looking at it. I mean, I think one of the greatest things when you read the Federalist Papers is this concept of rights and responsibilities go together. And when the taxpayer was required to take on responsibilities, those rights got, you know, obviously start following. And I appreciate you working on this part of it, uh, breaking very new ground. Let's just hope it's not ground that we, we have to cover ever again in the future, and let's work on that. I, I think that your comment about the regulation that we're considering, one of the concerns I see is re basically continuing the process of the federal government deciding salary rather than empowering stockholders who are actually the ones who bear the financial responsibility and should have that. Wouldn't you agree that is the vehicle that we probably should be looking at is those yeah. who pay, play, and be determine who get I yeah, think that's yeah. right. As I said earlier, the asterisk to that general view, which I share, is that at least as to these seven companies, Congress spoke and said that since the taxpayer is the primary creditor of these seven companies who received the most top assistance, as to these seven and only these seven, there should be more monitoring and determination of pay. Because rights and responsibilities, the, fi the fiscal responsibility um, leads the, the, um, the right to be able to intervene. Uh, what worries some of us is that we're starting to see this as being an excuse to intervene in other companies where the responsibility has not been taken over, but the right is, is being proposed to be preempted. I can't speak for the Federal Reserve or others. I know that I have publicly, again today, expressed the view that my jurisdiction should not be extended beyond these seven companies, and only as long as they still owe the taxpayers money. And I appreciate that. How many members of your team were drawn from the private law firm, um, from, from your private law firm? And uh, I think myself and two others. Can you, you, would you mind naming them? Uh, Ms. Camille Byros, who's sitting right here and Ms. Jacqueline Zins, who's also sitting next to Ms. Byros. Okay. The rest are all Treasury officials. Okay. All the rest of them are Treasury officials? Yes, I believe do so. You, do you have the names of the Treasury officials? Um, they're all here. I can get you those names, okay. yes. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, now, there's a lot of reports been going around, but um, latest is, um, that's, according to those reports, your team, your team includes academic cons um, consultants. Two. Uh, Professor Ju um, Lucian Bebchek from Harvard and Profes Professor Kevin Murphy from the University of Southern California. Hey, right. I appreciate that. And that's the kind of clarity I think that President Obama really wanted to set as a new example. Rightfully so, pointing out the previous administrations have not been as transparent as we hope. Um, and that creates concerns that really so many times just don't need to be there. Um, the, um, at this time, will you provide to the members of this committee the names and the, um, the subjects and the venues of uh, all the individuals that you rely on to work out this, this issue? I'll be glad to do that. I can tell you right now, summarily, there's the two academics at Harvard and Southern Cal, and there are the people here at Treasury with two others from my law firm, and that's it, about 15 people. But I'll get you the information and, and, and uh, in transparency, lay it out to you and let you have all that information. Thank you very much. And that's how we avoid all of the he says, she says, or we hear reports when we don't have it. Thank you very much. I would the gentleman you. yield? I yield to the gentleman from California. You know, uh, being an old employer, I, I couldn't resist asking one question. You've had more than half of the uh, key 25 of AIG and B of A depart. How many outside individuals under similar pay to the people that you're losing 
did you hire? In other words, not from within, not people that are already number 26 or number 28, but how many new outside people have entered the ranks of the top 25 of those two companies under the conditions you're willing to pay? I don't, I don't know the answer to that, Congressman. It's a fair question, and I'll try and get you that if answer. If you get back to us on that. Additionally, uh, Madam yeah. Chair, I'd like to enter Bloomberg.com's article uh, into the record at this time because it's been brought up. And then just ask one closing question, which is, uh, if the uh, credit default swaps had, had not been paid at full value, but at 60 cents on the dollar, which was a negotiated amount, wouldn't that amount that wouldn't have gone to oh, Goldman Sachs and other companies, wouldn't have that been greater than all of the executive compensation that you're going to handle over your tenure? Uh, I'm not sure, but by, I'll, by, I, by a magnitude of many. I, I, I'm not sure, but I will assume, based on the ranking minority member's question, that the answer is a definitive yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yield back. I yield back, Chair. Okay. Mr. Foster is recognized for five minutes. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Feinberg, for appearing today. I really appreciate it. Um, the first question I have is sort of technical. When you attempt to align compensation incentives with long-term company performance using stock that um, it has to be held over time or vests over time, do you encounter problems in preventing employees from simply hedging against a possible decline in the stock value? Prohibited by our rules and regulations. Very okay. good question. And who, who enforces this, especially for former employees that are holding the stock that's going to vest over time? I would guess with, with any of our um, final compensation determinations, if there's a violation, I would assume that that would be referred to the Department of Justice. Okay, but do they have to report? If you, if you leave the firm and then, um, you know, for the next several years you have to go and file some piece of paper that says, I have not taken a hedging position in some offshore derivative market that you don't I know think about? I think we would monitor that and, and be required to do that, yes. Okay. So there, there are financial statements that have to be filed I think years, so. after your, years after you're terminated, okay, and your staff is at least not shaking their head. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So now I may get corrected okay. in the next hour, and if so, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, down the hall in the Financial Services Committee that I also serve on, um, we have sort of a broader um, concerns about the compensation structures for systemically important firms and not just TARP recipient, recipients. So based on your experience in dealing with the corporate culture and so on, um, I was wondering if I could have your reaction, if writing, if you're not comfortable doing it now, to two possible um, uh, structural changes in compensation that might help. Um, in, in going forward in, in, in systemically important firms. The first one is the requirement of periodic stress tests for systemically important firms with negative implications for executive compensation in the case that the stress test didn't come out well. So that if you're seen to be operating a company that will not withstand a 20% decline in asset values or whatever the stress test would be based on, that actually that would have a negative implication for the bonuses this year. So that's suggestion one. Um, suggestion two um, is that, as you probably are aware, the administration or the Treasury and the Financial Services Committee staff jointly proposed uh, industry-wide assessment into an FDIC-like insurance fund, and it would be post-funded so that um, this would be after, you know, if a too-big-to-fail firm failed, um, the whole industry or at least firms above, I believe, $10 billion in assets get, get effectively have to pay into this fund to cover the losses. Um, and I was wondering if you have a reaction or could provide one against making that assessment not only against the firms themselves, but against the highly compensated individuals, um, and perhaps even using a clawback provision. Again, those are uh, questions. I will get back to you. Th those corporate governance questions um, are very important. They're all part of the total determination of what constitutes credible compensation. Um, to the extent that over the next few months we're dealing with in designing compensation structures for employees 26 to 100, which is on my watch. It is, it is suggestions such as yours, um, Congressman, that, that you know, we should take a look at. I don't know if it should be part of my report or be part of the broader corporate governance reform effort that's underway, but clearly uh, those are um, suggestions 
uh, that, that ought to be considered, yes. Yeah, so um, what I'm looking for is a response of you personally, not as a as special master, because you have been on the front lines of this. You've dealt with the corporate culture. You've seen what makes people jump and what makes them shrug, and that's what we have to understand. I, I will uh, honor your request and get back to you then as right. a layman, as a private citizen. Thanks very much. And Thank I you. yield back. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Jordan from Ohio. Thank the, the, the chair, and I, uh, I apologize. I was over on the floor doing, handling a few suspensions for this committee, Good so job, if I ask some things that have already been asked, you know, bear with me if you would. Um, Mr. Feinberg, we appreciate you being here and your, and your uh, staff as well. Um, was there any coordination? I mean, you, you, in, in some of your responses to uh, Congressman Bilbray, uh, you talked about the independence of your place. Was, was there any coordination when last week then, when your findings came out along with what the Fed is planning to do? And as I read what the Fed's planning to do, I mean, I think about Security National Bank in Urbana, Ohio. It looks like they, they, you know, the president there could be, in fact, potentially uh, having the government look at, at his, his or her compensation. So uh, was there any coordination, or is it just the luck of the, the, the way the world works that they happen to come out the same day? We, we have been, co it was the luck that it came out the same day, frankly. Right. We have coordinated with the Federal Reserve in terms of keeping each other apprised of what I'm doing. We had no input that I'm aware of, none, in terms of what the Federal Reserve uh, released last week in terms of the content of, of its prescriptions. So not relative to content, but relative to timing, there was no, coordination. No, as, as a matter of fact, we did not. I had no contact with the Federal Reserve concerning the time of their release, Complete no. coincidence that those two, they, they came out the same day. Um, all I can tell you, Congressman, is that um, um, uh, th there was no coordination okay. and no um, right. communication in that right. regard. Do, do you, um, kind of some, again, sort of picking up where Congressman Bilbray was, uh, in, the, in the big picture sense, are you troubled? You know, you think about cars are, pays are, TARP program, energies are, stimulus package, bailouts for the auto industry. Are, are you, as you look back, uh, and you can probably guess where I come from, do you think we might have been a little better off if we would have never started down this road in the first place? I'm not going to second guess Congress. I've learned over the years that's a mistake. The American people uh, sure do, and I, I sure I, do. I, I can only say, uh, Congressman, as I've said it publicly, that my, my role is relatively very, very limited. It is the seven companies that are owned by the American people that I'm focused on, and that is all I'm Let focused on. Let me ask on. you this, Mr. Feinberg, then. Are you, uh, the slippery slope argument, are you, are you nervous? In light of comments by people like Senator Schumer, who has talked about expanding this to any publicly traded company. Um, you know, I guess I just look at this and I'm thinking, who would have thought in the United States of America we would have the federal government, the special master of executive compensation, telling a private American citizen what they could make? I mean, th sometimes if you step back and, and ask the fundamental question, I think you, you stop and think, wow, this is amazing where we are at today in the United States of America. And that's a concern, and it's also a concern that when you think about it, you know, we're a country of over 300 million people, and we have this huge market. We're the largest economy in the world, and now one person, one single person is deciding what people make. Is, I mean, to me, that is, that is, that's a dangerous, dangerous place we're going. And then when you couple it with, again, what Senator Schumer has said, where this potentially can take us as a nation, it's no wonder Americans are frightened, and frankly, some members of Congress are pretty scared, too, where we're headed. I have two answers to your concern. One, my job and my office and what I'm doing was established by Congress in a federal statute accompanied by official tre Treasury regulations. I'm, not, uh, I'm serving under the law, and I'm, I'm obligated to serve under the law. Mr. Mr. Feinberg, I understand that. And, and, you know, I get it. And I get the fact that these, these companies, these firms held out their money and took, took the taxpayer dollar. I get that. My question is, does it trouble you as the person who has that responsibility where it could potentially lead and the, the implications of taking this step when you already have members of Congress, frankly, important members, influential members like Senator Schumer, talking about where it goes next? I am troubled. Uh, and I say so in my public statement, I am troubled at the notion that my role currently with these seven companies, uh, I am troubled at the notion that it, might, that, that it could be expanded. Well, it's important that, that is you, a mistake. It's important that you emphasize what you said earlier, 
it stops here. Because, I mean, that's what scares people. And, and I think that, God bless you for saying it, but it's important that you, you, that you stick to it. Now, let me ask you one quick question. I have a couple seconds left. Um, it seems to me that, that the administration has gone to great lengths to keep you, you know, they, you, know you met with the Treasury Secretary a couple times. You don't meet with the, with the, with the Obama administration. So tell me about that. Tell me the relationship you have with uh, Treasury Secretary Geithner. I have an excellent relationship, not only with the Secretary of the Treasury, I'd like to thank, but with, the, with other officials at Treasury and at the Federal Reserve in terms of consulting with them concerning these decisions that I'm making, suggestions that I'm making. They have been extremely cooperative in offering their advice to me at my request. Ultimately, the decision's mine, but I have sought out a wide range of views. The academics that I mentioned earlier that are our consultants, uh, individuals at Treasury, individuals at the Federal Reserve, in an effort to come up with a report that I think is balanced, that is fair, and most importantly, complies with the statute and the regulations. Thank you, Thank Madam you. Chair. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Dr. Chu. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Fitz Mr. Feinberg for um, testifying before us today. I know you have the limited purview of these seven companies, but uh, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Morgan Stanley, of course, had substantial loans. They've paid it, paid it off since, and they are no longer under executive pay restrictions. However, uh, with their profits recovering from the government bailouts, all three firms are expected to make huge payments to their executives this year. And in fact, um, according to Attorney General Cuomo, Goldman earned $2.3 billion in 2008, yet paid out more than twice that amount, $4.8 billion in bonuses. What authority would it take to stop such negligent and uh, reckless behavior? What could we do to stop this? This is well, very that, upsetting to the American people, as you know. That, that, that is a, a huge legitimate question. What authority? Uh, uh, tr historically, the authority has been the self-regulating marketplace. Now, to the extent that um, that's supplemented by the Federal Reserve, by the regulators like the SEC, the FDIC, um, that is a subject that Congress may want to revisit. I, I want to emphasize my reluctance to attempt in any way to broaden my jurisdiction beyond these seven companies where I'm trying to collect money representing the taxpayers as a creditor. I'm not saying it's not a legitimate concern. I'm just saying that um, it, it's a subject that goes well beyond my jurisdiction, it seems to me. Well, uh, there is one company, GMAC, which is um, under your jurisdiction, and it has already received $12.5 of TARP money. However, uh, they are asking for a third bailout and how do you plan to ensure that the additional $5.6 billion that they're requesting doesn't go towards these unscrupulous compensation practices? Um, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are very vigilant in making sure that the compensation practices that we have articulated in this report um, are fair, are reasonable, and um, will be paid by GMAC to its employees as part of this program. I'm not sure where that extra requested funding will go, but we want to make sure under the law that there's sufficient funds at GMAC to pay uh, these officials, and we'll, we'll make sure of that. And for them to control their compensation practices? They control their compensation practices subject to our rules and regulations in which we ha have mandatory jurisdiction, Congresswoman, to make sure that we're monitoring that, that comp those compensation practices. Uh, well, let's, let's talk about AIG. I know that you made some major exceptions to pay, to pay cuts for three senior AIG executives who had signed contracts for multi-million dollar bonuses prior to your appointment. You stated that you're, you're reluctant to invalidate contracts prior to the ena enactment of this current law. But do you have the authority to override these contractual rights? What can be done about this, this situation? You have AIG um, employees who, well, let's see, four employees made over $4 million. One employee made $10.5 million. We, we have authority under the law to, to attempt 
to work with the company in renegotiating those contracts. We have been successful in almost every case, although that's the exception that you have referenced. Three individuals at AIG. What we did with those three individuals at AIG, they had a contract, they insisted on um, honoring that contract, they had every right to insist on honoring that contract, and therefore, under the law, I took those contracts into account in reducing their 2009 compensation. Beyond that, I had no authority to act, and I think that, uh, uh, that that's what I did under those circumstances. Okay, um, well, there are alarming findings that executive compensation is actually increasing, even though there is this outrage by, by Americans. Um, now that you've had the experience with these seven companies, what would be your rec recommendation on a going forward basis? I think going forward, we will continue. First, to implement the recommendations in our report that call for a reduction in cash compensation of around 90%, a reduction in overall compensation of around 50%, cash plus stock. In addition, I am hoping, uh, and we've also reined in perks, we have also tied compensation to longer term performance, and I'm hoping that our recommendations will be followed not only by these seven companies, which are required to follow them, but I'm hoping that some of our recommendations will voluntarily be adopted by other companies seeking to improve their compensation practices. We shall see. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Today's time has expired. Mr. Cummings is recognized for five minutes, to be followed by Mr. Connolly. Mr. Feinberg, I want to thank you for your testimony. And I've listened to you very, very carefully. And I do believe that you have done what you've been instructed to do. I, 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 and I think you've done an outstanding job. Thank you. Let me just try to get down to where the rubber, rubber meets the road. You know, I think part of the reason why this is going on, why you're doing what you're doing, what, why the Congress asked you to do what you're doing, is so that, and you've implied this in your testimony, Part of the reason is to try to get other companies to do this beyond the seven. And I have had an opportunity, I know you got maximum cooperation, I think you said, uh, with AIG. And I've had an opportunity to meet with the former head of AIG, Mr. Liddy, and to listen quite a bit to what he had to say. And I read the papers just like you do. I have absolutely no confidence, none, that the things that you're able to do, and it has nothing to do with you, there is a culture on Wall Street that will cause them to reduce salaries. I mean, consistent with what you just said a minute ago. And I mean, in your, in your, I mean, and, and you're a very bright and straightforward person. I mean, what do you see, what, I mean, what would cause them to even do it? Because my dealings with them is like we're on two different planets. They have, I think that when they talk about multi-million dollar bonuses, it's like shoeshine money to them. And I'm serious. And so, and they, when you talk to, well, I talked to Mr. Liddy about my constituents who are being thrown out of their houses because of foreclosure losing their savings, everything, and they still, they still wanted to give money to the financial products division and to, not, to seem to not even have a clue or not give a hoot about these folks and at the same time handing out millions. I mean, it, I, I just can't see how with all your fine work that is going to be turned around. I just don't. I mean, I, I've been around a long time. <laughs> and number two, I was wondering what advice, do you have conversations with the president? And because let me tell you, I believe that the American people, in order for, for, in order for um, all of the things that the president's trying to do to right this economic ship, 
if the American people aren't there, and if they feel like they're getting screwed every which way, and certainly it goes beyond these seven companies, and you know, so the question becomes, are we, um, I mean, what do we see? What do you see? And don't forget, I mean, I know what you're hoping, but Mr. Borowski said something the other day that really impressed me when he was giving us a, giving us a little uh, talk about his report. He said that, that, that Secretary Geithner and others, whenever he's, he comes before us, they listen. So here you are before us. You're the man with the seven companies. I'm trying to figure out what will it take, if anything, this may be a culture that's impossible to turn around, to make these folks move in another direction. Congressman, you're asking a, a, a political science question about the difference, the gap, the gap between Wall Street and Main Street thinking on this subject. Um, I, a, I can play whatever role I can play, hopefully, in impressing upon Wall Street generally the value of what's in this report. Whether or not Wall Street will pick up on any of this, I do not know. And give me your best argument. That's what I want to hear. You're talking to Wall Street. You said, Wall Street, we've got a great report here. This is why you should do this. Your best argument. My best argument would be to Wall Street that this is why you should do this, because if you don't do this, there may be a time when, when Congress or others will rein in, uh, will rein in pay and will limit your discretion and will limit your unilateral ability to determine what to pay people. I mean, to the extent that these modest proposals, modest in the sense that they only apply to seven companies, to the extent that they are ignored in the private marketplace, ignored, well, I mean, the question is, will Congress, in its wisdom, um, sit by and allow compensation to go forward under the old regime and the old way of doing things? I don't know. I, I've got enough problems, as you've witnessed this morning, dealing with these seven companies and, and um, um, suggesting that my role should definitely not go beyond these seven companies. Uh, to um, express a view on what global decisions should be made by Congress to try and rein in Wall Street. That is a subject of uh, uh, beyond my, my jurisdiction and one that uh, I wisely don't want to get near because I don't want to undercut my credibility and my effectiveness in terms of dealing with these seven companies. Thank you very much, we, Chairman. We, we might need another master to do that. <laughs> Congressman Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Feinberg, thank you for your willingness to serve. Um, you know, in listening to some of the rhetoric about this subject on the other side of the aisle, one, one, one would think, if one knew nothing, that uh, Congress and the federal government just have this irrational compulsion uh, to interfere in the private sector and arbitrarily set compensation limits. Well, what's your understanding of why your job was created, Mr. Feinberg? My job was, it's clear, my job was created by Congress and the Treasury to establish compensation determinations designed with one primary objective in mind, to get the taxpayers' money back. And that is the primary objective. Now, how we do that... Mr. Feinberg, uh, I understand that, uh, and thank you. Uh, but why? Was something, did something go wrong? Why, why did we decide on these seven companies? These are the seven companies that were, that were uh, allowed, uh, I guess, to survive uh, on the back of the taxpayers' willingness to contribute ah, these funds. So the private sector, the free market, in fact, had failed. Is that correct? Correct. Let's take one of the seven companies you oversee, AIG. The, lar the largest corporate quarterly loss in American history was in the last quarter of last calendar year, and it was none other than AIG, is that correct? Correct. And AIG has the, been the biggest recipient of bailout funds, is that correct? I think that's, yes, that's correct. So it had the largest loss and the largest single taxpayer bailout in American history, is that correct? Correct. Does the public have any interest at all in wanting to see 
some kind of rational compensation limits in a company that has bailed out, the biggest in its history? Insofar as the public's view is reflected by the statute that I'm um, uh, working under, yes. Does that seem a rational concern on our part to you? No. You think it's not rational? Uh, I think it, it, it is. It's a rational response to the crisis, yes. In protecting the public's interest? Yes. Thank you. Um, let me ask you this question. One of the four broad mandates that Congress gave you in creating the statute that created the special master was to review prior payments. When your office reviewed prior payments to senior executives in AIG, what did you find? Uh, because presumably you found something wrong in the fact that you've chosen to roll back some of that compensation. With most of the companies, we found that prior to the enactment of the law, there had been prior payments actually made. There was nothing nefarious or illegal about it. Those were contracts that were entered into prior to the uh, enactment of the statute creating my office. What we did find going forward under my tenure, we did find that there were pending payments that were obligated to be made under prior contracts, and we were able, through negotiation with the companies, in almost every respect except two or three cited earlier, to get those contracts voluntarily um, invalidated. And instead, we rolled the amounts that were involved in those contracts into prospective performance-based stock. Ah, performance-based. Yes. When you looked at compensation, prior compensation, and in your report you're submitting today, looking forward, I assume that there's some rational basis for your coming up with the recommendations you came up. For example, we've heard some rhetoric here today that would seem to suggest that the sky's the limit. We have no business even talking about limiting executive compensation, even in companies we've bailed out. Um, but, and you, you agreed that within some reason, any limit is arbitrary. I think that's right. I mean, But would you not agree, however, if I said uh, the CEO's compensation in Company X ought to be 200 percent of Company X's entire profit for the year, that would be an irrational compensation, would it not? I think it probably would. So, so it's not entirely arbitrary. Oh, no. It's not. Our, decision, our decisions weren't arbitrary. Our decisions absolutely were based, uh, I think, were based on a reasonable evaluation of the data and the anecdotal information we received from the institution, the seven companies. I would defend my report as being not at all arbitrary, but very, very principled, very rational, and very reasonable. Now, people may disagree, but I think it is clearly uh, a reasonable and defensible report that was submitted uh, to the Secretary. And you used the words performance-based. Could you just elaborate on that? Because that's where we get into the rational or arbitrary here. It's tied to some kind of rational expectation of perf financial performance on the part of the company. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. We rejected out of hand the notion that regardless of company performance, there should be guaranteed salaries, guaranteed bonuses, guaranteed commissions, guaranteed perks, guaranteed, guaranteed, guaranteed. And what we said in our report, and what I recommended, is that the, the era of the compensation guarantee is over. And instead, other than small cash-based salaries, the remainder of the compensation package should be tied to performance. And not only tied to company performance, but tied to company performance over a period of time so that you cannot simply short the stock, sell it after a year, roll it over. You've got to hold it for up to four years. And then we're hoping the long-term benefit of holding that stock will tie the official's compensation to the overall value of the company as reflected in the stock. In addition, one other point. We also offered up the notion of longer-term incentive-based stock in addition to salary. 
But that stock cannot be redeemed. It cannot be sold until and unless the taxpayers get their money back. That's the, the formula we tried to use to correct what we thought in our report uh, were the problems with executive compensation practices in these seven companies. I thank you, and yeah. my time is up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <coughs> right. Thank you very much. And I hear one minute from the gentleman. Oh, I appreciate the chairman. Yeah, I just want to make a point on my, my friend and colleague from Virginia. Um, they talked about the private sector failing. I think this is important to understand. But the private sector didn't fail. We had, we had some institutions that had some major problems. But to argue that the private sector failed is just, in my judgment, fundamentally wrong. Certain institu institutions fail in the private sector every single day in this country and across, this, across, across the planet. That's part of capitalism. That's part of what the problem is. Once we start down the road, that's when we get into all these questions and all these problems. Yeah, thank you very much. But let me just say this before I yield to the gentlewoman from New York, uh, that you know, there's a lot of concern about these folks who have failed going to another company. You know, I'm not sure that anybody would be too excited about hiring people that fail. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't think you have to worry about that too much. You know, they run one country in the ground, one company in the ground, and then you expect to get big money to go to another and do the same thing. So I, I don't know if that's a real concern. You know. Well, w we hear the argument all the time, and the argument goes, you know, you, you've, you've expressed one view, and, and ranking minority members expressed a view. You know, there are a lot of vacancies. The question is, those vacancies are now gone, and whoever was going to leave would have left? I don't know. We are trying to implement the statute, uh, keeping in mind both of those positions. It's a balancing act. You know, I think about members of Congress, and we think we're so great, but when we leave, somebody take our seat. <laughs> and they do real well. Uh, I yield now five minutes to the gentlewoman from uh, New York. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, I'd uh, like to welcome Mr. Feinberg and uh, mention his truly outstanding work as a special master for 9-11 during a very uh, difficult period in our country with a very difficult topic. You did a very fine job. Um, I, I'd like to ask how we are faring internationally in terms of our compensation compared to foreign countries. We are in a global market now. We are competing with uh, firms across the world. And, and how does uh, U.S. executive pay compare to, say, pay in Japan and in European countries? I'm not, I, I can get you that data, Congressman. I can tell you that what I do know is that there's been a great deal of recent G20 and other cooperation between Treasury and the Secretary and other companies in, in, and other countries in trying to come up with a common set of international standards governing compensation. How, how much American compensation varies from Japan or Germany or Italy, I don't know, but I can certainly get you that data. I'd, I'd like to, to know, and uh, I, I also have read that the United Kingdom um, adopted say in pay rules uh, or a shareholder vote on executive pay, and uh, are you aware of that? And has that made any difference in, in pay scale, or have you followed what's happened in the United I, Kingdom? Again, I think that's of recent vintage. I will, again, try and uh, secure some information concerning the impact of that uh, in the United Kingdom. And uh, the United Kingdom's uh, five largest banks have reportedly agreed to abide by the G20 executive compensation rules. And have U.S. banks uh, likewise agreed to accept these uh, conditions, and which include an independent compensation committee and clawbacks for poor for for, for poor performance? Uh, not on my watch. I don't know. Uh, I'm limited to these seven companies, uh, and again, at the risk of um, um, disappointing you, I will uh, get you answers to these questions, Congressman. And um, do you? Are you aware of any other legislative fixes or actions that we should be taking in, in terms of uh, tying executive pay more to performance? Well, that, that raises the whole question that I've discussed earlier about corporate governance and, and, and what Congress is considering, as I understand it, in both the House and the Senate, concerning both corporate governance reforms in federal legislation and um, uh, corporate um, uh, regulatory reform. 
And both of those uh, subjects certainly are part of the overall concern about total compensation, even though those two subjects aren't directly part of my jurisdiction. Okay. The, the law gives the firms the right to appeal within 30 days of the compensation determination. And, and do you anticipate appeals? And if so, how will they be conducted? I haven't received any appeals as yet. Um, I'm hopeful there won't be any appeals. If there are under the law, we will certainly give due consideration to those appeals. But as of yet, uh, as of today, uh, Congresswoman, we don't have any appeals. Okay. And, and the New York Times reported that Citigroup, as well as other banks, continue to offer grant guaranteed bonuses to employees. And, and does that uh, violate the Treasury regulations? It all depends whether those employees that are getting those grants, allegedly in the New York Times, fall within my jurisdiction of 1 to 25 or 26 to 100. Um, Citigroup and other companies under my jurisdiction, uh, at least legally, have the authority to um, um, act independently if they're not part of my mandatory jurisdiction. Now, I could, under the law, issue some advisory opinion uh, uh, if I knew more about uh, such, such uh, bonuses, and we'll, we will look into that. Um, do you have the authority to override contractual rights? No. If the contractual rights are found by my office to be valid, legal, and binding, then we, we give due deference to the Constitution and the fact that the sanctity of contract should be, recommend, or should be upheld. But, as I said earlier, we do have under the law two ways to deal with these old contracts that might be found to be valid. One, we can seek to renegotiate those contracts with the company. We have been very successful in doing that. And getting the company to voluntarily yield on those contracts and roll it over into performance-based stock. Second, if a company refuses to um, voluntarily modify the contract, we can take those contracts into account in establishing prospective compensation. So we do have some weapons at our disposal. Thank you. My time has expired. We've been called to a vote, and thank you again for your service to our nation. Thank you again, and Congressman, thank you for all your help on 9-11. Uh, you were a stalwart in convincing your constituents to come into the fund, and I will always be in your debt for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and let me thank you for your testimony. You were an outstanding witness, no question about it, and we want to let you know we appreciate that, appreciate the work that you've done, and uh, we really, really want to continue to stay in touch with you as we move forward because, as I indicated early on in my opening statement, the American people are angry, and, of course, you're helping to sort of calm them down. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, you and the ranking minority member need only call, and I will be up here as soon as possible. Thank, thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now our second panel. I think your audience is going to disappear now. <laughs> well, with your staff leaving, there's plenty of open seats. <laughs> thank you. I'd like to welcome our second panel of two witnesses, Professor Black and Professor Roberts.
As with the first panel, 